Yeah, so I'm here with uh, Hilmar Rafson. Uh, Hilmar and I uh, have been speaking for a number of years. Um, some of you guys remember back in the day when I was when I discovered energy and was like, I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff with energy, uh, but I was having all these weird, like, not weird, like amazing spiritual evocations, which were very shamanic in nature, but a lot of negative entities and energy was coming out and I wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, Hilmar came out of nowhere and started talking to me one day and um, and I was talking to him about it and Hilmar's like, so at the time, at the time I was figuring that, okay, I've got some kind of Kundalini energy, but I don't really know what I'm doing, but I've learned how to use, I've learned how to manipulate energy. Anyway, so Hilmar came along and was like, dude, you need to change your meditations and uh, orient yourself more towards uh, loving concepts. And I was really not open to that. I was like, no, dude, this is this is unbelievably sensual energy. Anyway, after a while, I ended up doing what Hilmar said, and all of a sudden things became more balanced out and pretty cool. Um, and at the end of that period, Hilmar was saying to me, he's like, you know, he's like, um, he's like, you know, Scott, like a lot of the... Uh, problems that people encounter with kundalini uh, are relevant to the inner child and at the time i wasn't really open to the idea but i thought whatever you know i mean you seem to be right by the meditations let's give this a try and see what happens but i didn't really connect with the idea at the time um but turns out hilmar was right about the inner child and uh as i i've kind of connected with that in a big way in the last month more or less like i did like a, an awakening to the inner child. Hilmar had a lot to say to say about the inner child back then. And that all seems to be really relevant today. So I thought it'd be interesting to bring Hilmar back on uh, for a couple of reasons. One, Hilmar is starting a new program, uh, which is coming up, uh, which is, I'll let him talk about that later, I guess. There's a, he's doing a two-year program with people, which could be really useful to anybody trying to um, to augment, or not augment, just to connect spiritually. Um, and what's good about Hilmar's work is sometimes, well, I'll get to that in a second, I guess. How are you, Hilmar? I'm talking a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing really good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm really I want to do this whole chat by myself, man. You can just sit and watch me talk, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess that's what an intro is about, I guess. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, you did well, yeah. man. Yeah. So, dude, um... <clears throat> Let's just start. Let me just ask like really basic stuff. Like I think we'll start off just talking about the inner child and what that what is how would you what is the inner child? What is it? Well, um in the Jungian concepts, like uh, they talk about the inner child as being an archetype. So and and that's I can relate to that. It's an archetype, but it's also something very, very personal to each and every one. Um, so the inner child is <clears throat> a collection of children, actually. Like, I, I, I like to talk about that the inner child is a whole busload. There's not just one inner child, because uh, the inner child or these different versions of the inner child is always related to something happening in life. So, like, I'm going to take myself as an example. Um, so I, I had bad stuff happen when I was eight months old and, and, and that, you know, did something to my nervous system. And, and there's a part of me that then remembers that. So there's an eight month old version of the inner child. And the next, the next traumatizing experience was when I was three and there's another version of, of little Hilmar there. The next traumatizing experience <clears throat> was when I was five. So again, another version of Hilmar there. And again, when I was seven, again, when I was nine, pretty much I had a lot of trauma when I was a child. Like was, I was really, uh, um, let's see, not taken care of like by, by those that were meant to do that. But, but that's, again, the choices that my soul made like before coming here. So... <clears throat> so that's pretty much the basics of the inner child is that it's it is like happenings relating to 
traumatized experiences, like or traumatizing experiences from your childhood. And it's always, you know, surrounding something that happened. So, um, and when we come closer to this phenomenon and working with the inner child more and more, then we will see that the this part of us is actually the most powerful part of us. Like this part of us is where the magic happens. This part of us is where our creativity actually comes to fruition in a very easy way and so on. Like when you when you are someone who has a well taken care of inner child, then, then your processes in life are gonna be somewhat easier than for a person who, who does not have a well taken care of inner child. So, um, so everything in life becomes easier when you have healed your inner child or, or even just when you're in the process of doing so. And my insights tell me that because this is totally designated by the doings and choices of the soul before we manifest physically, that then I can say with confidence that everyone get exactly the experiences needed for them to be traumatized in the right way so that they then can build the personality construct that they then were were set out to design because that's that's what this does like so the personality construct is pretty much um created so that we can deal with things that have happened right so we, we, we can say that the personality construct is a collection of experiences from the past reacting on the now. If you're not really, let's say, if you haven't worked that part out. But all of that is something that comes from the inner child, like to begin with. So the protector part of the ego is a really, really hardcore thing in most people. Like when, even like in posh, you know, rich ladies, like, you know, their protector ego can also be like a really heinous killer type, <laughs> just, you know, the metaphorically speaking, but uh, yeah, so, and, and this protector ego, like the, the origins of that protector ego is that the inner child needed to feel safe in the world. So, so that's what it is. So practically, uh, the inner child is the creator of pretty much everything that people relate to or do or how they conduct themselves in life, like when they are older. So it's a really, really big thing to, to go in and work with your inner child. I read something recently and uh, it was this book. I, as I was pushed towards the inner child again, I, I was rereading this book called the presence for, I read this book, the presence process a couple of years ago, but or a year ago when I did the Rasa non-dual transmission and it didn't really i read it i was like whatever and then like uh I, you know this month it i came across it again i just i just connected with this book at such a profound level and what it's about is it's about coming to terms with the inner child and it's a program 10 week process to do it it's really blowing my mind and a lot of the stuff is what you talk about but one of the interesting things he uh he said which you mentioned here uh in a different way but like what he says in the book is the problem is is when you're when you're younger between zero and whatever age he puts it into like seven year cycles so let's mm -hmm. say between zero and seven for the first child he was saying um yeah. what happens he's like is the problem is at those ages you're you don't you don't a lot of those years you haven't learned to talk yet so there's mm -hmm. no way to make there's no mental body created yet so there's no yeah. way to store the experiences or to rationalize the experiences so the experiences get forced into the emotional body uh, where there's no language to understand them and they start to get lodged in like, um, like I don't know, like, like, uh, like some kind of negative energy which can't be explained. And then that gets covered up with more experiences and then over time ripens, if you will, and in some cases putrefies or whatever. And the other thing was what he was saying is like, I mean, son, I think, like what I know from your experiences is you were really traumatized. And like, oh, yeah. when I think about my own life, I mean, I always think that, you know, I wasn't that traumatized. I mean, there was some stuff, there was some, I, well, 
you don't think you've been. But what happens is it depends on your sensitivity. And it also depends. It doesn't really matter in a way. It's almost just like what you what you call the protector of ego comes in. And it's when that relationship is created, yeah. that relationship forms the foundation for for all kinds of crazy future events, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you mentioned there was being like the uh, the soul contracts and sort of being traumatized in the right way, because that's like this is this has been chosen as a way of you to um, to sort of um, allow you to develop. You know, I was talking to my mom recently and uh, I was talking about this stuff, you know, and she was saying that she's like, uh, I was like, I was talking about this inner child, the trauma. And she's like, oh, it's because of the divorce with your father. And I said, I'm like, mom, you know, it's okay. You know, this is like, this was part of the, this was done. Yeah. I said, this would, I like, you know, I'm like, I would never have reached where I'm at spiritually without this, without this. Right. So the trauma is almost like a pivot. It's like a pivot which allows you to sort of move in a different direction, right? Um, so oftentimes the choices, there. I'm sorry. sorry, yeah. Oftentimes the choices that the soul makes is, you know, for an incarnation is something that is coherent with a previous lifetime. You know, I don't know if you've noticed that in your own experience, but are you familiar with the term samskaras, like that you take sure. personality traits with yourself from one yeah. lifetime to another lifetime? So yeah. when a soul is making agreements with other souls for, you know, traumatization or whatever experiences, because we, that's what we do. We, we make these experiences before we come here and there. So the choices are already made. But um, when, when that is happening, like, reasoning for why the choices are made the way that they are is to be in alignment with samskaras for previous lifetimes you see so the choices that the soul is making is always a key that unlocks something that was from previous experiences so when um uh, so it's like a continuation of of the way that that you let's say, if you want to see the whole movement, then see it like this, that the individual soul gets made by, um, uh, that the soul kind of breaks off the, the whole collective soul, like the oversoul, God, like you can see it like this, that, you know, like a cloud in the sky, if you observe this cloud in the sky, and it's quite large, and you can see that the one, you know, piece of cloud is just moving away, that's, in that way, God made us in his own image. And, and this is how an individual soul got created. And so if you look like from that point of a creation of an individual soul and all of the choices that got made throughout thousands of lifetimes until we again come to the point where we're melting together with the whole, like all of the traumas created, all of the um, uh, agreements between souls that have been created we're all just that one movement, right? So when when you look at it like that, you know, we can be in our personality constructs, we can be shaming ourselves, we can be hard on ourselves for how we did in life and so on. Like we can we can uh, uh, have experiences that in our in our youth or childhood creates uh, addictions or creates that we somehow are prone to to let's say be um, when you, you know, maybe anorectic in life, that you are life anorectic somehow, that you distort yourself from life, that you remove the beauties of life from way from you somehow because of these uh, experiences that you had, then, you know, you can be hard on yourself for all of that. You know, when you're related to this personality construct, which we are, but when you get out of that and really understand that, all the movements that you made were actually towards the ultimate. Like, don't be hard on yourself. Wherever it is that you are in your development, you know, this, this having love, having possibility to embrace yourself, to have space for all of your movements and so on. Like, those are really valid um, things to have with you, like, in, in your progression when you're working with these things. So, so the inner child is a representative of the soul 
or God in the human body. Um, in my own experience, I've um, met my, let's say, the, the, the deepest part of my soul, or we can call it the, uh, the core of my soul, like I've met that part of me, and that's, that's uh, God, or that is Paramatman, or, or whatever you want to call it. And, um, and that part of me showed that the inner child is the child of God. So the spark of God inside humanity is always the inner child. So when we are in good alignment with the inner child, then, um, as I said in the beginning, then all things in life are going to be a lot easier for us. So, yeah, um, I just got a message from Zoom saying that the uh, the meeting is going to stop in ten minutes, which is weird. So, um, if that happens, I'll just I'll send you another link and we'll start up, and I'll just edit this so that it all goes together. Yeah. No yeah, what you're saying there about the this is interesting. It's one of the most interesting. It doesn't seem interesting. It seems kind of lame and boring at first because that's what I thought of it as. But it's the most important lesson, and it's also something. I was speaking to this lady Tara Springett on the channel. She's an author and she's a tantra teacher, and she was talking about this about being soft to yourself, being loving to yourself, and this sort of like. Um, this sort of unconditional um, softness. She's written a bunch of books. She had another book recently, which I was reading, which is about diet and how mm -hmm. to do the diet. And the way she does diet is the same way. It's just like just being really nice to yourself and always choosing the best mm -hmm. ingredients. And oh, and even if it's even if it's less food, as long as you're choosing the best things, there's always it's this idea of always choosing the best. And this is it's it's and it's like and there, and then there's that and then there's this idea of just being. So like ni nice to yourself, which is funny because it seems like it seems obvious, but like um, but you know, you like most people, for many people, I never did that. You know, I was so critical. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. Uh, and it's all. And I think what happens is, it seems like what we're doing is we build these structures. I think this is what I think is that when you experience this trauma, you get pushed in. Because you're experiencing trauma, you move out of the present moment because it's too painful. And so you move into dreaming about the future or you move into lamenting the past, right? And so, and then as you move out of the present moment, uh, those, those uh, basically the future and the past are imaginary spaces, right? They're, they're, they're other dimensions. They're other dimensions of existence. And what seems what seems to happen is that those other dimensions give you the ability to to plan and configure and structure ideas in it's almost like an alternate reality, which is got nothing to do with where we're supposed to be, right? And then and because we're in this other reality, then we start um like uh sort of making uh concessions or sort of trying to uh what's the word I'm looking for? You try and work out what the problem was with the present moment. And you're trying, or, or you're looking in the past, like why did that happen? Oh, it was me. And there's all these relate. You build all these imaginary relationships, mm -hmm. which the present moment doesn't need. And so, almost part of the reason it seems to me that being nice to yourself, just that idea, in a way, all it does, it softly neutralizes those. Um, it softly. And beautifully neutralizes all those uh, logical constructs which you've made in the future and the past dimensions. Mm, yeah. And just by annulling those, that seems to, in some ways, bring you back down softly. Yeah. The consciousness... That makes sense, yeah. yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. It seems like consciousness is like... Um, consciousness is way more powerful than anybody will ever be able to understand, but... Mm -hmm. The local consciousness of humanity or of the individual could be described in that sense, like from presence pushed in through pushed in through the medium of the inner child into these other dimensions of the future and the past, you know. And um, and so what you're saying, that was a funny thing, because you were talking to me about this a couple of years ago about like uh like just trying to be realistic about like what's going on in your life, what are the things that make you angry? 
what are the things which, and it's like, yeah, why was this going to help, right? But what you're actually doing is all of these, all of these things that make you angry are actually, these are actually the points. This is actually the pathway into the construct the inner child yeah, has exactly, made. Yeah, that's right? how it is. Yeah. And so, because you don't. Yeah, and also, like when you're when you're powerless over things, that's also a pathway to check out like the things you're powerless over, like things that make you like unmanageable, like to lose your cool. Like those are openings. Like, um, and and what it what it opens up to is the person, you know, the the protector ego. This is this is uh, you know, the protector ego is built around the illusion of power, right? So. Like when I say that the illusion of power, it doesn't mean that it does not have power because it can impact your life in the now because it's active. Like everything that's active, it, it impacts. So it impacts in the now, but its power is not that of the omnipotent soul that you already are, right? So this this part of us, the protector ego, it, it wants to act as if it is the soul. Uh, and it's a, a way of, of survival. Like it's a way of telling yourself a story of yourself just to maintain a feeling of self. And that's, that's how it works. Like it, and it does that through a lot of different defects of character and the, all of this storytelling that you're talking about, like in the future, in the past, like all of that is just, is a part of the protector ego holding itself alive. Like it's making sure that it has a, a uh, source of energy so at some point the the master like this this deepest part of my soul gave me a vision and he was teaching me about exactly this part of it like the the ego and, and he did that for for some while like and i got different visions but this particular one can relate to this a lot and um it started out by being a uh, you know, I saw my body was hovering and in some space that was kind of dark and, and I was standing behind my body and I was seeing like in, in the distance that there was this dark being that was standing there and that being sent a thought to my body and my body reacts. It took a long time for that thought, the initial thought to move to my body and my body reacted somehow and some uh, signal came back to that being. And so the, the, uh, it happened more often and it happened faster. And in that way, a nerve got created. And so and all, it always came closer and closer, the being. And then at some point, the being then stepped into the physical body on the right hand side. And it was inside the body and outside the body. And as soon as it came into the body, it started to create an image of itself outside of itself so that it could look at itself. And then the master, he said, and this is the energetic lock with the ego, right? Yeah. And so, and then, and then he showed me that this was only just a means of making sure that there is a perpetual flow of energy and because this is a low vibrational being but this is also something that you know we as souls have agreements with like where where personality constructs come from where ego comes from this is something that we all have agreements with before we come here and so and the way to deal with it is to then understand like how does this storytelling work like what type of feeling of self is it that this part of you, this protector ego is trying to maintain and why? Usually because that there's just something else that you don't want to feel. And when you feel that, then this illusion here is going to crumble, you see. So, so stopping the flow is also in stopping the storytelling and, you know, and not going into uh, needs to project yourself in false ways to just have or, or maintain a certain feeling of yourself. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, uh, that was the lesson. It was quite big of a journey to go through this and, but it's, uh, it's ongoing. Like, of course, like everything else is. So. so we had a little problem there with the zoom. So we just switched over to a different service here, which I'm recording manually. Uh, anyway, Homer was talking about this character, which uh, came down and connected with him, this sort of low vibrational character. And, um, it's interesting because I, I've I've actually had an experience similar to that, but in reverse, 
like a few, and it was probably a few years. This is a long time ago, but like I had an experience where I was, I was trying to forgive somebody and I couldn't find the way to do it because I had so much anger. And it was, and actually at the time it was ayahuasca was telling me I had to forgive this person and I couldn't do it, you know. And then one day I was going to work and it came into my mind again about I have to forgive this person and I couldn't do it. But it kept coming, it kept coming. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just draft an email. And what and what the what the message I got was that, you know, it's not enough to forgive somebody. It was like, you've got to ask them to forgive you for your... <laughs> For, for the things which you did poorly, you know, um, and that was, that was really difficult to do, you know, but I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll just go and I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to do it just like they've said to me or, you know, just like that. And so I did it and I said, all I did was send the email, but the moment I sent the email, I was at the train station and I saw this black character get out of me from the side and vanish. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, what the frick? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. It's, it's weird. weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that book, The Presence Process, he talks about what some of the things you were talking about in a different way. But like, um, what he was saying is, he was saying that when you're, um, he, he's like the problem is with these dimensions. I'm gonna call them dimensions of the future and the past. What happens is we move into those dimensions, and we actually live most of our life from there. And I see this daily now. I see myself. I'm really adept at moving into the future and the past all the time. I do it all the time. Mm-hmm. And um, and he says the problem is is that when you come, if you do come back to the present moment, what happens is like, uh, or he says what happens is is as you're living in the future and the past, there are problems from the present moment which might need addressed, and you don't yes. see them, or vice versa. Exactly, yeah. And so what happens yeah. is you get blindsided. And he says what? And so mm-hmm. one of uh, in the second week of the presence process, um, one of the he's got little mantras you say, and the the uh, this the second week mantra is I acknowledge my reflections in the world, and so what he says is he says Beautiful. that yeah, what he says awesome. that when you are when you are living in the future, what happens is you come up against these things which might annoy you. You'll meet somebody they're driving you bananas. He's like that's actually being projected from presence because the presence mm-hmm. is trying to get your attention. It's trying to get exactly, your attention yeah. to return. <laughs> That's how it works, yeah. It's trying to get your attention to return back mm-hmm. to the presence. And so it does this yeah. by, by uh, pro- it's you. It's you who's projecting this out. And um, that was the weird thing is like, as I was mentioning to you, I've been working with this tantra guy, Tomer, who I did an interview with on the mm-hmm. channel. And Tomer gave me this mantra. Uh, which was supposedly for spiritual protection. But the funny thing about it was it kept bringing me back to myself. And it kept bringing, <laughs> uh, you know, I was thinking, you think spiritual protection, it's going to be some little angel guy is going to show up on your shoulder and like with a shield and a sword to banish all the evil. And all it <laughs> really did, all it did was bring me back to the presence process and the inner child. And I was mm. like, what? I'm like, what is going on? And it was like, it's it's you. And it was like, that did that is such a huge. <laughs> I can't even tell you what a, what a, a revelation that's been. Just thinking, wait a minute, this has all been me, the whole yeah, time. It's all been you, yeah. Yeah, and so how how I've learned to see this is that. So something happens, and in order to deal with it, the this pain of whatever it was that happened, it usually is related to our, our, our childhood is that it has to do with uh, betrayal, betrayal of the parents somehow, uh, in my case at least, like, and in most people's cases, you know, even, even just a parent being busy and not being present, not being, you know, uh, there for, for a child is just enough uh, to create betrayal. So it's like there are so many different facets of, how uh, inner child can get hurt by the lack of love. And that's usually where it's at, like the lack of love or traumatizing experiences. And, and that's, that's, that, that's, you know, the lack of love and, you know, the traumatizing experiences are going to create, um, let's say, a way to perceive yourself. You know, because mother and father were like so-and-so, or let's say, you know, some other significant grown-up 
were, you know, acted like so and so, then it means that I am like this or this. You see, so it's it's like um, uh, the way that, that that this works is that uh, you know these years they create our base programming, you know, our our experience of ourselves, how we view ourselves, how we think life is, how we think everything works, how we think we are, and how we think we need to play ourselves out in life. So, and all of this is something that comes from that level of ex of existence from the inner child. You see, so so. Something happens, we need to deal with it, and we deal with it by creating a personality construct that's, which at its core has a protector ego. Inside the protector ego and the things that make the protector ego work, firstly is that it is a being of darkness, meaning that we're not aware of it. You know, not that it's just you know, dark or evil in that sense, it's just in the darkness, it likes to be hidden. It likes to, likes to not be seen. So, especially in a grown-up, um, and it works also by defects of character. Works by <clears throat> meaning that it works by dishonesty. It works by pride, uh, greed, arrogance, uh, impatience, intolerance. You know, and all of these words. Like usually, this is something that makes people cringe. Like in, in today's hunky dory you know, pink elephant spirituality that you're seeing all over the world. Like just to, to, to talk about real, you know, shadow work and, and to really get your hands into the gory bits of who you are. Like this, this kind of makes people, um, you know, it kind of pushes them off. Have you ever seen the memes where it says like, uh, uncomfortable spiritual, no, like, how was it? Like uncomfortable truth and, uh, and, uh, and a comfortable lie. And, and like, there's a, a, a whole line of people where it says comfortable lie and uncomfortable truth. There's just no one there. Have you ever seen those? Like that's 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 how it is when we come to you know real hardcore uh, inner work and actually spirituality because that's you know spirituality becoming enlightened. You know is the process of healing the things that went wrong. They, of course, they didn't go wrong, but uh, um, that's oftentimes how we view it, though. But Becoming enlightened is also healing yourself from the wounds of the past, uh, coming into, as you were talking about before, to have forgiveness for, for everything and everyone and yourself included. So, and to another part of this is, you were talking about before, like how people are with themselves, how you are with yourselves, with yourself, like in, in terms of being gentle, in, in terms of being loving in terms of having your own back and knowing what that means in every single moment, like the, how to have your back, how to be in, in context with yourself. So there's always me and then there's me, right? You see, there is the, the me that is projecting me and then there's the me that is receiving me, you see. And I always project myself out into the world and I'm also the one who receives myself out into the world, you see. So, and meaning that everything in life always arises in the relationship that happens between you and you. And that relationship is 100% dictated by, you know, things you've been through in your childhood, how you are with you, you see. So this is, in Denmark, we talk a lot about social inheritance. I really love these words put together. Social inheritance means that, you know, I'm around my family, I'm a child, and I'm observing them and their behaviors, no matter if they're positive or negative, social inheritance is going to make sure that these behaviors, these imprints, is something that's going to be burnt into the bark of my brain in such a way that I carry myself, I view the life in the way that they did, and, and so on. So it's like an inheritance of a social nature, which comes from the, the family, which is very close to you. So this is what dictates how you are with yourself. If you're loving, if you're present, if you have your back, if you're able to just know that everything in your life, it, it, it arises in this relationship with yourself. You see, that's, that's, that's where it comes from. So if you see your, your mother being hard on herself, if you see her uh, um, have no leniency toward herself, and, and your father maybe, uh, you know, in, in a bad way or something like that,
the, the these things are going to go in as an imprint and you're going to you know, be the same way with you because it's this is the social inheritance. Those are the things that are not said, but you will be, you know, programmed by these these things. The world is like so and so. And then you believe, yeah, OK, the world is like that. And then you're going to build from that. Right. So and that's also a part of like our soul's choices is to be. Uh, impacted is to be formed and molded by the social inheritance in some family, like the same family that we choose to come through. So it's all a matter of choosing consciousness or not, right? That mm. that's that's what it is. You see, yeah. if you're unconscious, there's just going to be like a whole area, a great plethora of some thing inside of you and if you just don't care about it then okay like and why don't you care about it most people don't care about it because it hurts they don't want to feel the things they used to feel and they want to be the architects in the now of how they feel right but you know if you're if you're not ready to get your hands into the gory bits if you're not ready to hold space for all of you like that you're not going to get the the outcome which is the fruits of the labor you see what I've learned is that the way that I am with myself is that I never, ever betray myself. Never. Meaning that whatever happens in life, I'm going to have my back. Why? Because I experience the opposite, just like we've been talking about. I don't want to experience the pain of what happens when I don't have my own back, you see. You know, losing yourself is going to be the lesson in how you regain yourself. The only reason we lost ourselves was to regain ourselves once more. And so this regaining is that I understand that my love for me is number one. That's, you know, everything else is secondary. And you might talk about that as being egotistical or whatever. Then I say to that that the true form of selfishness is good for everyone. So, but... The lesson in having your own back, never betraying yourself, always loving yourself as good as you can, no matter what. You know, betraying myself would also be running away from my feelings. Like that would be like the, let's say the ultimate betrayal of myself is that I don't feel what's actually here. Like, and to, to be someone who's able to feel and hold space for whatever feeling that's in my inner child, that's in whatever part of my masculinity, my femininity, whatever that's inside of me, my divinity, my godliness. If I don't want to feel some of it, then I'm betraying me because that's what is you know, meant to be there in the now, you see. So if I'm running away from me, I'm inherently betraying myself. And the only reason I can do that is because I got betrayed in the past. So you learn that, the social inheritance. Someone betrays you. They don't want to acknowledge your feelings. They don't want to see your light. They don't want to have your presence. Something like that, you see, and that's the betrayal. And then you do that same thing to yourself later on, right? So that's what it is. When you say um, you've got your own back, uh, you mean yeah. like... Um... How do you mean that? You mean like, it's almost like, uh, so for example, one thing like in that presence process book, one of the things the guy talks about is like, when you have, uh, you become aware of these reflections, which are coming in. And he talks about reflections and projections. So a reflection is when you become aware of some energy coming out of the inner child. Let's say, to put it into context for people, let's say I'm like coming home from work and I suddenly have the desire to drink a beer, right? I go, I'm going to have some beers. And like, but you know, why is that? And is, is that, is that actually, there's actually some trauma emerging and I'm actually trying to cover that up? Like, oh, I don't want to deal with it. And so in the presence process, mm -hmm. process what he talks about, he's like, listen, when these things emerge, it's like what you're saying is you've got to just try and be conscious of it. And so what I noticed is there's almost like, for me, there's like a moment of like, before any, there's a moment of unconsciousness. You have to engage in unconsciousness to avoid the inner child. You have to do it. And so what happens is sometimes... <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's so true, yeah. So what happens is sometimes, <laughs> sometimes this desire comes up and you're like, oh, and I didn't notice it before, but it comes up like, oh, I was going to have a beer. And then I'm like, uh, I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, this is, this, is, this is like an inner child trauma. 
and then then you can hear this. There's this almost like no, no, no. It's there's like negotiation. There's negotiation going on. Saying, oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, no. It's it's yeah. uh, and there's there's an attempt to pull it into an unconsciousness space just yes. to buy the beer, right? And the it's moment storytelling, you, yeah. And the moment you pop so that the, beer so open, it's, it's done. You've entered the unconscious space, and it's cool. Yeah. For example, I think so. The beer is a part of the protector ego construct, then. So yeah. that's why the negotiations are happening because that you know then you would be taking something away from the protector ego that's actually making stuff work for that part of you too. Yeah, you know it's yeah. interesting. Um, there's that there, there's one of those old in, Indiana Jones films. It's him and Sean Connery looking for the Holy Grail, and there's a funny mm -hmm. scene in that film where they um they they, they get to the, they get to a ta they're in like the the space of the Holy Grail, and there's like lots of different cups. And the Nazis are there, and they have to choose which cup is the Holy Grail. And then yeah. the Nazis are looking at it, and like, here it is, and they pick up the most golden, jeweled cup, and they drink it, and then they instantly die because it was the wrong yeah. cup. And the Grail the is a cup, simple, yeah. it's a simple wooden cup, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and so the body of Christ, or whatever it is in this film, is the simplicity. It's the softness. Mm -hmm. It's not the explosive, imaginative idea. It's the simple common thing. And mm -hmm. I think this is funny because this is something that sort of uh, was really surprising to me. Like, um, I mean, dramatically in the film, sure, that works. That's cool. Big surprise. But in in terms of what you were talking about, um, enlightenment is, mm -hmm. it almost sounded to me like you were saying like healing, <laughs> healing is enlightenment, right? Yeah. And yeah. Healing I, I yourself what a lot of people is the think, road to enlightenment, yeah. Well, a lot of people think, and I know I've been like this too, is that, you know, if like you go to an ayahuasca ceremony or you can meditate and you have these explosive vis explosive visions and like evoke spirits and you can do all this crazy stuff and that seems like enlightenment but mm. there's a difference it seems to me that like there's i don't know it seems like there's like like just recently like like, like last week i was sitting at my computer and my heart shagger opened up and mm. I, w I was just reading about this stuff and just it just Oh my God. And it was like, it was like a completely different language of life. Like I'd never experienced before. And it was, it's funny because it's almost like you get these openings in the like third eye or whatever, which are visual. And it's almost like those are the, that's the jeweled cup, which the Nazis picked up. Right. Mm -hmm. But then the heart mm -hmm. checker, it, just, it feels almost like it's, it's this healing energy, which mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It seems funny. Cause like, what is what is enlightenment then? Is enlightenment healing, or is enlightenment the ability to have visions and everything else? Well, I would say that it's uh, it's both. I guess, like you know, enlightenment has many different uh, angles to it. Of course, like I, I like to say that you know, there's no one uh, there is no one thing to master to become enlightened. You see, it's like you know, if if we talk about enlightenment, we can say that look at like, uh, or imagine an area that has a lot of ladders, right? And so, and the one ladder is meditation. The other ladder is, let's say, healing powers. The one ladder is working with your inner child. Another ladder is working with a protector ego. Another is harmonizing your, your inner feminine and masculine. You know, you know, and these ladders are, are you, know, you can, you can, crawl up the ladder, like walk up the ladder, and the higher you get, the more enlightened you get. So in, in the end, like you have this ladder and you're standing at the top of that one, meaning that you've mastered that part of the human psyche. And in that way that you, you have oversight. And and then in, in the next one, if you if you if you do diligence, like if you do your best, then of course you're gonna soar and you're going to stand at the top of that ladder in the end. So 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 enlightenment is to stand in many ladders at the top like and there is just and where does your soul want you to get the experiences needed which areas is your soul seeking enlightenment in so you know it's it's just a matter of of let's say uh investing your energies enough in the same area until you get it and then you move to the next one i guess but when I say that healing is the pathway to enlightenment, what I mean is that what you're actually doing, going through your own healing process, or at least for me, and you know, I've, I've, I've had a lot of trauma in my past, 
And, uh, and so, and I really love all of my traumas today. I really, I'm so blessed with having the pain that I've chosen as a soul before I came here. You cannot begin to imagine like how amazingly beautiful it is for me to be able to grow through the pains that I've had. Like, and so I can't express enough like how grateful I am for the pains that I've had. So, but all of these like, is, um, let's say, it, it is the projection of the soul so that the soul can come to the fruition that it wants to, right? So, and the fruition is to create the personality construct so that it can be deconstructed again, so that the light of the soul can be programmed into the body. And that happens through the healing process. You see, wanting to see yourself, wanting to feel yourself, having no resistance whatsoever towards yourself, towards life. As soon as you have resistance in life, you're gone. You don't have your back anymore. You're not there anymore. You see, as soon as you, you're not moving with the flow of what's happening both inside of you and outside of you, then you're not with yourself anymore. So, and that's a total, um, like, you, you, you have to be with yourself to be able to do the movements, right? Either if it's healing or, or whatever it is you're doing, you have to be with yourself. Yeah, I thought, I thought somebody was saying, um, it was probably the presence process guy again, was saying that the, um, is like the trauma, it's almost like, I mean, I guess this is, this is almost obvious, but it's like you're born, you're born enlightened. But then what happens mm -hmm. is the trauma creates these threads into these other dimensions and that creates this, this protector ego which mm -hmm. encapsulates you from the enlightenment. And then so the process of healing allows you to dissolve that protector ego gun. Almost exactly. like, um, it's funny, you know, like um, when I was doing this in the last week or so, just the, uh, and this shack, this heart shack opening, which was astonishing. But the heart shack mm -hmm. opening was very much like the, when I did that Rasa transmission from this guy, Krister, it was the same experience, you know, and it's mm -hmm. this, uh, it's almost like, and the funny thing about the Rasa experience was, and the heart chakra experience is, at the time I was saying to people, like, you know, if you were a Christian, you would mistake that for the return of Jesus, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's that, it's <laughs> that beautiful. And this is, it's, it's completely mm -hmm. peaceful. All of a sudden, it's just like calm in the storm. Everything makes sense. It's just like everything, everything makes sense. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's funny because I did like all these ayahuasca ceremonies and plant medicines and whatever. And, you know, I'm really grateful for doing it all. And like, it really opened me up and, and the whole thing. But, but this is what I was looking for. And yeah. It was like, and it was just like in the last month, let's say. Uh, and it was, just, th this is it. Because it's just like everything just gets reduced to, ah. This is it. No, I'm still confused about all the like all the stuff I've seen in visions. It's like okay, so this is this is what I need. Like this this heart opening and this healing of the inner child. It's what I need. Like this is what Scott needs to mm -hmm. to to find peace in life and in this world. And that's in a way, it's all you need. And mm -hmm. I, I'm still I'm still uh, wondering about like all the alien visions and everything else, you know. But the uh, but, but that is the important thing. It's funny. You see a lot of like Buddhist guys, like, uh, and they all, you know, they don't talk about Kundalini much. I mean, you and me talk about Kundalini a lot, you know, and the Buddhist mm -hmm. guys, they talk about it. They, uh, some of them talk about it as the arising and passing away. And they, they kind of skip over it because they're like, well, you know, we're just going to move on to other things. And yeah, it's a, it's an interesting uh, process, but, um, but well, it's it skipped over in so many different traditions. It's not just there, like it's, it's all over the place it's skipped over. Like, and, and reason being, even though when we go, even if we look into like ancient India, although that we have the Kundalini Upanishads and different uh, like gurus or swamis that are writing on it, but still um, there, there isn't a lot of information of like, then that happened and then you go through this and then there's not like a path, you see, there's not a Kundalini path as such that has been laid out like, um, Reason being that, you know, what the energy does when it gets active, when she's working with you, like it's, it's different from the one guy to the other guy, like that, 
because what you programmed into the cells of your body is not the same experiences that I've had programmed into the cells of my body. So the things that the Kundalini is going to be pushing on in you is going to be different what she's going to be pushing on in me, you see. So the experience for my, my experience is going to be of a different nature than your experience is going to be. Although that we can be in agreement about that there are certain aspects that always are going to be through universal truth, that this is just how it is being a Kundalini human you know, like experiencing the energy, you will open up spiritually, you will get a path of some sort of a, let's say, divine therapy session. Like for me, like that's ongoing 24, 24 hours. So like there are like some things that are going to come again, but the, the uh, individual process is because of the individual incarnation and the energy is always going to be meeting you where you are and that's going to create that that there's not going to be written down like some some kundalini path as such but so since we're talking about this i might as well um you know say a few words about my kundalini apprenticeship program because that's pretty much what i'm attempting to do is to outline from my own experience you know not just the inner circumstance needed for a kundalini process to be you know, powerful, to be transformative, to be good for you. Uh, but also I've outlined like uh, how to deal with the magical abilities, how to come into the energy, how to work with the energy, how to um, work with the physicality, how to assimilate with the energy, like how to assimilate the body with energy. Uh, and, you know, one of the modules is called uh, melting in the higher spheres of consciousness, uh, meaning that you know, we, we learn through the energy to to come up into the higher spheres of consciousness and melting there means that, that you're actually getting changed. And inside that space, like a few minutes of experience and healing are so powerful in the everyday moment, you know, in, in removing these samskaras and so on. So, so I'm actually doing what, or that's what I feel I am. I'm doing what I feel that has not been attempted to really is to create an outline program for Kundalini people to actually grow by. And so far, like I've had a few people go through the program so already, which means that that we've, we have the skeleton, we have the meat on the bones, and it's now just ready to be, be sold to, to those who are, are, um, are wanting to uh, explore and expand through the holy kundalini so um yeah. i think sometimes with these kind of things is um like for example there's there's a process there's a process and sometimes like in our world we're used to like getting like instant gratification and one of the things the guy says in the presence process book is that actually the process itself is what engages you with the reality so you might not see like explosive visions that's not the point the point is this process which your program is the same thing is to sort of hmm. guide people it's like the engagement of a process and that sort of long-term process uh is almost like uh it's it's a sort of divine intention to which connects one of the interesting things i yeah. one of the interesting things i started doing like a year or a couple of years ago and I just came out of nowhere. I decided, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy some flowers and just put the flowers in ours. And that represents God, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just all. And I didn't really, it's like a sadhana, but I, I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm just going to take this. And that's going to, I got to tell you, ever since I started doing that, my life got better. Everything mm -hmm. started getting better in my life just because it was part of a process. And it's like, yeah. so you, you make these like intentions to, to something better in life, something more mm -hmm. beautiful. And it seems to work. Now, one of the mm. things about Kundalini is it seems to be like um, often identified with the feminine. And we've been talking about the inner sure. child and you've mentioned the divine masculine and feminine a bit. And like, yeah. how, does, how does Kundalini relate to that? Does it relate to the divine masculine, divine feminine? Sure, of course. So um, my Kundalini process has, has, uh, has led me to, you know, as I said before, that the Kundalini is going to be pushing on things in you that are that are be different than what she'd be pushing for me. So, so my process has been very much about trauma release. My process has been very much about like uh, 
let's say, blockages, like to remove blockages from the nervous system so that there's clear pathways for the energy to actually move through and to actually you know, make sure that my body is able to hold high consciousness and so on. So that's, that's what the Kundalini is actually working towards with all of us that have her active. Is the reason why I say her is because that for me, Kundalini is Shakti, the goddess Shakti. Like, um, so I can have the energy active and, and then following what the energy wants for me. I wake up, my, my third eye awakens, my crown gets connected to the divine. And, and then all of a sudden I start to have communion with, with Shakti herself. Like I see her, I see her on my inner eye. I relate to her, I talk with her, I hear her, right? So Shakti is, is very much a, a living goddess that actually has connection with this energy that's that's lodged in my spine, that's always becoming more and more potent. And so Kundalini, I love to think of Kundalini energy as the affections of my mother, right? Because my mother being everything material in the whole universe, my universal mother, her love for me is Kundalini. So that's her Shakti is the gift of the universal mother, uh, maybe because of all of the traumas that I've been through. Uh, maybe, and of course, because on the soul level, I made agreements with having have this energy with me through this lifetime as a partner to grow by, right? So, but coming to the relationship between Kundalini and the inner child and the divinely feminine and masculine counterparts. Um, so there is, for me, there's been like a natural progression of, of growth. Firstly, I had to work with the protector ego. Then after that, I was ready to work with the inner child. Reason being that the inner child is very knowledgeable of the fact that the protector ego is pretty much a monster. Right? The protector ego is a monster that is the inner child's own creation. So it's kind of afraid of its own creation, like inside our body. So, um, and um, making it so that if you start working with the, with the inner child before addressing and really working with and understanding the workings of um, the protector ego, you're not going to have a lot of results, you see. So I was lucky. I went through this process Firstly, like this with the protector ego, then with the, um, the inner child. And then after that, when, when I have a really good relationship with my inner child, then, then the next logical steps was to heal the connection that the inner child has with these other archetypes, which is the masculine and the feminine. Like, and firstly, what we look at is not the divine aspects of these parts of us at all. Because what we work with is where the hurt comes from, where the pain comes from. You know, what did our parents do? And, and so on and so on. Like, uh, so I had a lot of stuff with my mother. Actually, actually both my mother and father. Uh, uh, so, but it started out, like, after I healed the, the inner uh, child, well, mostly because that's an ongoing process always as well. Um, then I started getting the access to the, the feminine. And, and how that happened was that the, the, um, my inner world started to just show me pictures of things that happened in my childhood, things that related to my mother, things that related to my grandmother, just everything feminine, my cousins, like who was a, was a, a girl and, and so on. So, so everything related to, to experiences that I had with the feminine growing up was something that the Kundalini then started pushing on. So the things that needed to work out was something that she showed me. And that's something that, you know, when you're a Kundalini person that you need to then be able to understand what she's showing you, like what she wants you to work with and so on, and how she's actually pushing on things in your consciousness so that you are able to then see them, so that you are able to then release the programming that they've had on you. So. Releasing all of that, going through all of the pain that the uh, the feminine had given, and and 
And that's still an ongoing process too, because now I'm a grown man. I've also been uh, uh, like, I've, I've had girlfriends that, you know, things have been gone sour sometimes. And so it's, it's, it's the, the hurts, uh, sometimes we get re-traumatized by the one thing or the other thing that we experience. And that will then remind you of all of that which happened in the past again and again. So, um, so it's about always being on your feet too, like on your toes, like um, understanding that the life will always happen while you're here. Uh, and so, working in way, sorry, sorry to here, so. so in a way, it sounds like the process you're describing is like you, you uh, become aware of the inner child and the protector yeah. ego, and then you, you try and work through that stuff. And then there's almost like another layer of like uh, emotional issues on top of that, which is, which yeah. might be related to the inner child too, some of it, but this is like the feminine and the masculine, right? So some of that- It's related to, it, it's always the, the relationship the inner child has with, with each, you know, with the feminine or the okay. masculine. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so it might be part of the same structure and then extend out into its own thing too, as you get older. Exactly, yeah. Like you get this re-traumatization or whatever you want to call it, and then it's- Yeah. 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 So what happened to me was that, and this is really, really weird. I think I actually told you about this at some point, but so Shakti became very pr present and I started having feminine feelings, like very much feminine feelings. And, and it was coming from her, uh, like physically coming closer to me as the goddess Shakti than, than my physical body was, was emanating from her, um, what she had so i started to feel very feminine feelings and and at some point um she came so close and the vibration was so high that uh, i started getting orgasm in my brain like i orgasmed in my brain for three days and i had this liquid come out on my head that's called amrita and and in that moment what's actually happening is that the the feminine and and masculine counterparts are melting inside the body so and and that was the most amazing experience like i've that's that's a part of yoga or melting with god that that i want for every human being to experience like this is uh, quite massive but after that like for a few months i had no feeling of a gender like i did not feel uh, feminine i did not feel masculine i did I, I was just feel being, I was just present and that's it. There was no like uh, imprint whatsoever. And, and that state was there for a few months and, and the orgasms still were happening, but I would get like spots now, not inside the brain. I could get like a spot of an orgasm here on my shoulder or maybe on the side here. I could get an orgasm on my thigh. <laughs> it was really weird like that. But uh, all of a sudden, all of that stopped and this really divinely masculine presence starts to um, express itself through my physicality. And, and then you might talk about Shiva or Shiva Shakti or Bhagavan or Paramatman or what, whatever um, masculine counterpart to the divinely feminine, you would relate to that. Like that would be the experience that I had pretty much. And that's an ongoing thing too. Uh, and today, like I'm working very much with the divinely masculine, and that's extremely uh, related to the Kundalini process and the energy in and of itself. But the energy Kundalini is still feminine in nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, uh, yeah, there was an interesting thing. We talked about this a week ago, and um, it was really helpful. And one of the things that you were saying was that. Uh, like and one of the things that happens is as you release the um um actually before we talk about this I wanted to ask you something else I was going to ask some I, was, I got another thing I want to ask you about is okay. I want to go back I want to go back a little bit there to the protector ego and um, mm -hmm. you were saying you worked with the protector ego now it seems yeah. to me like the um the like the way I'm working with the inner child is just trying to be when I feel these surges, which come all the time, it's just like, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It comes like every 15 minutes. There's like a, there's this surge. It's like, dude, I can't, what is going on? It's like, and it's literally making decisions based on these repressed traumas or whatever they are. 
Uh, well, the surgeon says that the inner child wants your attention. The inner child is trying to establish the grown up. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, uh, so that's then the, the way I've been learning about this in the presence process is just just uh, allow the energy to come, just sit in the energy and sort of accept it. And, mm -hmm. and that is really beautiful. I'm just wondering, yeah. like, that's an interesting process of working with your child. But is there a process you go through when you're working with the protector ego? Which is different, or is it the oh, same? Yeah. Process? No, it's it's not the same process. Like, uh, there's a big difference in how you approach the protector ego and how you approach the inner child. Uh, so, the protector ego, like, you need to be able to look at it as, you know, on the one hand, it's a friend of yours, you know, a part of you that's actually made it so that you've survived to this point in time, you know. So, on that level, we can be grateful. We can say thank you, you know protect your ego for existing, but let's be very aware that, you know, without a protector ego, our world would be a lot better off. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like that's how it is. Like, you know, if you see the world and understand it with the same glasses that I'm looking through, then what you see is that the world is dictated and controlled by burnt inner children operating through a massive fucked up protector ego. Right. Like, and that's, I, our world is so messed up. Like, that's how it is, you see. It's so obvious so, that's what's going on. It is, yeah. But working with the protector ego, like, you need to be able to see it, you know, like, let's say uh, that you're a general in a war and you have your army here. Like, on the one level, you have to look at the protector ego as that other general on the other side of the war who also has an army to control against your forces. So that, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, and that, that approach is needed because the protector ego is strategic, you see. So you would have to, you know, when you do the one thing, then the protector ego does the other thing. And then you realize that, and then it takes another shape. So you have to have uh, a constant willingness and readiness to see, like, how is this shapeshifter actually, you know, doing now, right? So... Uh, so you have to be able to um, see the protector ego from different levels. But let's remove the word protector and just look at the ego, right? And understand what the ego is. Right? So you, you are a soul, which is God, the Father. The Father, God, is the soul. That's, that's who you are. But you're also the physicality, God, the mother, right? The, the body, right? And everything physical here. Uh, and so... The soul, in order to have its plans come to fruition, there has to be a receiver of the plan, right? So, so look at it like this. That you're going through a, to a movie theater and you have the projector that projects the picture on the screen, right? And that's the soul. The plan of the soul is getting projected. And the screen itself, the projector screen, is the ego, right? So the ego is that which receives the projections of the soul. Okay, so that, that um, constellation has to be there in order for uh, movement to happen, in order for evolution to happen. So it's, the ego is a very, very important component of the soul's uh, planning coming to fruition. Therefore, the ego is a very, very essential part of the soul being ambitious and that it is because it wants to melt together with with the whole so so that's that's the one that's the way of understanding it that the ego in itself is just a, a screen a projector screen or let's say um let's say a canvas right and the artist is the soul and the canvas is constantly changing because the soul is always making a new picture, right? So, and that's, that's, that's the landscape that we have to deal with. But let's say that the soul has now chosen for a trauma to happen. And so it, it projects on the screen still. And let's say that what it projects is just like a rock. So it throws the rock at the screen and what happens? the rock gets grabbed by the screen and it starts to make like a ball around it and everything gets, you know, coiled up. Everything gets like bottled up like that. So, and that's where the protector ego happens. The protector ego is how you deal with receiving that rock 
onto the screen, you see. And so, and from that, like that's, that's where the whole array of defects of character and modus operandi and whatever else gets created that makes the protector ego tick, that gets created in the moment that the screen actually receives that stone that gets projected by the soul. So, so that's, that's a, you know, a way of understanding what all of this is and how it functions. So he himself is to then make this uh, canvas or screen to make that all straighten out again, right? And when you've straightened all of that out again, then you've just made this, the ego or the protector ego what it was always meant to be. And that is a servant of the becoming of the soul. Nice. Um... When we spoke last week, you were showing me, um, you were saying, and th this is like, it's interesting because the guy in the presence process goes down this path too, and he's not mm. a Christian, that guy, but he, but he uses the Christian ideas almost mm. as a metaphor, but you know, like, it's funny because they, they do seem to fit in a lot of ways. And oh, like, yeah. when we were speaking the other day, you know, you were saying, well, the, um, you showed me that image of. Yeah. Right, and um, and the in the image of Christ, there's the uh, there's uh, the baby Jesus holding a golden globe, and then there's another sort of adult Jesus holding mm -hmm. the baby. And yeah. uh, what what was your interpretation of that? That was an interesting interpretation. Well, this is this is uh, this is actually something that points to one of the hidden teachers teachings of Jesus Christ, and that is to heal the inner child and the importance of the inner child, right? So that's that's uh, uh, something that is uh, yeah, forgotten today, I guess. That Jesus Christ helped people that, you know, let, let the children come to me. Meaning that he was uh, able to heal the children, the inner children of everyone that was there. Knowing that he had the tactics and insights needed to be able to heal that. So, but let's come back to the picture. The picture is usually of some sorts that is holding a child. That can be a, a, a some Mary figure. It can be a Jesus figure, and the inner child. Or the, it, it is the inner child, of course, because they are holding their own child. They are holding their own inner child, and usually the inner child or the child that they're holding has a halo around their head and is holding, as you said, the golden globe. And the golden globe is an old sign of power. So the child has the power of life is what it means. And the, the halo around the inner child is a, uh, a sign of its divinity. The inner child is of course the first son of God inside of you or like the first seed um, of, of God, divinity inside of you. That's the inner child. So um, usually this halo of the child is, is more Say uh, flashy than the halo woman that's, or, or the, the person that's holding the child. The holding the child is usually not as flashy in these pictures or, or uh, paintings. And, and that means that, that the divinity of the holy child is something that smears off of on you as the grown up, right? Meaning that you get enlightenment through having healed your inner child. Right. So, and again, coming, I'm so lucky that I have my, my guide, which is the center of my soul. And, and he, again, he, when I looked into this and he gave me a vision, he showed me that, uh, so he showed me my, my physicality. I was standing in the middle here and on this side, the child was standing. And then on this side, he was standing is part of my soul, right? So, and, and he, I call him the master. I, I call him many different names, uh, but, but he, is, uh, he is Christhood also. He is uh, the God, like he's the father. He is my creator. He is, he is my individual soul who actually created me. So, um, and he showed me that this, he was talking through uh, the vision and he says that the one in the middle, which is you in the body, have to become a good conduit between the inner child and me, God, the Father, your soul. 
that so the the energy goes from God the Father down here. The energy goes again from the inner child to God the Father, and then this Trinity is going to create divinity inside of you. This connection that there's that you're able to have the fluidity in the connectivity between the part of us, like the the greatest part of us, and then the inner child. So, what does that mean? That means that firstly. Um, always when you're growing spiritually, you're always evolving your grown-up. You're always evolving your ego. You're always evolving upon your persona, right? Meaning that growing spiritually, when you become enlightened, then you're actually receiving a world-encompassing ego that's able to hold space for everything. That's another way of looking at enlightenment. And what it also means is that the, the grown-up, which is the conduit for everything that has to do with the inner child, has to be polished upon, has to be put in such a way that the grown-up is to remove energies out of the inner child, remove feelings out of the inner child, um, and to be able to have an inner dialogue inner child that is healthy making it so that that um, the inner child gets healed also so this whole process um, you might say that what this has taught me is that children are actually our biggest teacher my children outside of me my children that I'm a father to and my inner child are actually my biggest teachers Meaning that my inner child shows me what I have to be in order for that part of me to be harmonious. Meaning that my inner child puts me, the grown-up, into form that makes it so that, that things work, right? And it's the same thing with children, right? My children show me which needs they have. And me being an awakened parent, I am you know, watching what's happening with them, what they're doing, what they're experiencing, and so on. They are the ones that show me which needs they have. So they're actually my, let's say, in a way, parents. Like, in a way, them having needs is parenting my grown-up into being the best grown-up for them, you see. So so it's, it's a... Um, you know, being able to have humility in such a way that, that, that you can learn from, from children, you can learn from your inner child, you're, you allow yourself to be molded by, by these experiences, like, in the end, for me, like, has created some sort of an enlightenment. No doubt about that. So, for real. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we've been talking for a while. Let's wrap it up. I just, uh, that, was, that was a really good chat we just had there. That was awesome. I think you dropped a lot of knowledge here and um, amazing. Uh, where can people find out about your Kundalini program, which is starting? Yeah, um, so we're doing a Kundalini workshop that's free uh, for everyone to participate. We're doing that on the 15th of October. Information about that on my website, which is golden org site, like in vision, so golden S I ht.org um so in there like you'll you'll um, you'll get all of the information about the coming education um also i'm doing uh, sunday meditations every sunday um we do them at 11 11 pacific time here in denmark it's 20 11 we start meditating but we always meet up uh before the hour so 10.50 Pacific timing and um, here in Denmark, uh, 7.50 at the p.m. So, uh, and the divine meditations, I call it uh, divine meditations, is, uh, you know, we go through a lot of different aspects of meditation. Um, soon we're going to be embarking upon a, a collective journey through the chakra system. Uh, and that's going to be 10 meetings. Um, and after that, we're going to uh, do some elemental meditations, which you uh, inspired me to, to learn about. 
Uh, and uh, so I'm going to be sharing some of that too, like in the group. Um, and in general, like uh, the meditations are always directed at that you're able to, you know, experience that you are able to experience peacefulness inside or healing or something like this. Oftentimes I do Kundalini transmissions also in these groups. Uh, I'm going to do one tonight, uh, a Kundalini transmission into the heart chakra, which I love to do. And uh, yeah, so um, there's a lot going on. We have also a psychic skills course uh, that's that's in October 2, like on the 22nd we start. Uh, and we have a one-day uh, course as well that has to do with psychic abilities too, but that's in November. So there's a lot happening, and uh, you know people can reach out through my website. Uh, the events can be found on Facebook, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty accessible for everyone. It's awesome, Ted. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for coming on, Ted. That was really uh, and thanks just for just not just dropping knowledge here, but you've always been really, uh, forthcoming with information and help and everything else. You know, of course. Yeah as a guide and teacher yeah so thank you brother for doing thank that you. Yeah. yeah i'll wrap it up bro let me just wrap yeah. this up and stop the recording uh wherever yeah. i do that stop recording.